On May 1st, 2020, our federal government introduced an order in council, new laws and restrictions that immediately affected hundreds and thousands of legal and responsible Canadian gun owners. It's something that every Canadian should be concerned and informed about whether you own a firearm or not. This has all happened in the middle of a pandemic with no debate in Parliament and no chance for firearms owner like ourselves to be heard. With the stroke of a pen, thousands of guns have been moved into the prohibited firearms list and can never be legally used again. This is having a devastating effect on collectors, competitive and recreational shooters, and thousands of honest, hardworking people employed in our Canadian firearms industry. As hunters, this is bad news for us as well. The anti-firearms movement, as well as the Canadian government, have had their say, but no one has asked us. So we are speaking out now. In the middle of this pandemic, the only option to allow our voices to be heard are through interviews conducted over our phones, webcams, home cameras. The contributors to this documentary have done everything they can. This is our side of the story. Today, we are closing the market. That stroke of his comment cost me my retirement. We are banning 1,500 models and variants of these firearms. I totally feel that they're targeting the legal gun owners. As these things get eroded, the people that are fighting now, they're not going to be around. You know, if there was significant evidence to show that we were the problem, we'd be the first ones to say, how do we stop this? But we're not. We've been on one knee for way too long. They have a list of guns now that they're taking away. They, they'll just go after more and more the next time. These weapons were designed for one purpose and one purpose only to kill the largest number of people in the shortest amount of time. And the vast majority of gun owners use them safely, responsibly, and in accordance with the law. But what happens next is up to us. Wild TV and CCFR present Gun Ban Canada. Sponsored by the Canadian Coalition for Firearm Rights. Firearms Outlet Canada. LOF Defense Systems. The Colt Store. The Edge Group. Go Big Tactical. Iron Sights. Modular Driven Technologies. P and D Enterprises. Phoenix Indoor Range and Gun Shop. Prairie Gun Traders. Select Shooting Supplies. Vortex Canada. Want stalls online. Wolverine Guns and Tackle. For decades, Canadians have been calling upon successive governments for reform, for stronger gun control. And we have listened. And today we are taking action. Canadians are some of the most law-abiding, fair and trusting people in the world. We have a long, safe and responsible history with our firearms ownership here in Canada. It's a privilege that we do not take lightly. We've seen our laws change a fair bit over the years, although never quite like this. Here's a look at how we got here. If we, if we look back in history, we can see that uh, from about 1895 when they brought out the earliest law that we can find where they said that we had to have uh, a permit to own firearms and uh, ammunition in the day keep in mind they were in the middle of a war at the time 
uh, all the way through up till 1934. And again, there was stuff in between there up to about 1934 when they said we had to register handguns. Then in about 1951, that's when they started coming out with um, uh, legislation on uh, prohibited and restricted and non-restricted. They started coming out with that. Then we kind of turn around into about 1977 when they came out with the first FAC. Along with that, that's when they banned the full auto at the time, was in 1977. So they took that out of our hands at that point. Then we had the FAC. And then from that point onward, we roll back into, uh, you know, the mid, um, probably in around just uh, about... 2000 when bill c68 came out well just prior to bill c68 that's when they came out with the magazine ban when they said that we had to restrict it down to five rounds and then the big ban in my time was when they came out with bill c68 because when bill c68 hit the market uh it that's when they changed from the the fac program to the pal program what a lot of canadians don't know is that canada has some of the strictest firearm laws in the world very, very strict. And we've lived with these firearm laws, although many are unfair and they, they, they're purely punitive. We've lived with them for decades. Uh, so on April 29th, every, people were used to the firearm control regime that they had. On May 1st, the world turned upside down. So hundreds of thousands of Canadians uh, ended up owning, apparently, rifles and shotguns that were too dangerous for the public to even be in possession of. So the firearms reference table uh, just the initial list that came down the pipe, uh, that initial 1,500 firearms, and, and once again, it's more and more being added to it. It's not just um, their so-called assault rifles or military-style firearms. Um, we have firearms on that list today that um, that are the primary firearm they're going to use for a shooting, a simple target shooting discipline. You know, gun control as a political issue is always a loser. Um, no one is ever happy. The anti-gun uh, people are never happy because it hasn't gone far enough. And the gun people are, are never happy. They're obviously always upset because they're, they're paying the price for gangsters shooting each other in downtown Toronto. Or in this case, um, a madman dressed up as an RCMP officer murdering our fellow citizens in, in Nova Scotia. The, the tragedy in Nova Scotia was a murderous massacre, and I have never, ever used any of my firearms in anything like that. I find it unbelievably offensive that anyone tries to link a tragedy like that, tries to get mileage out of a tragedy like that in a sporting community. It's unconscionable. It doesn't let the people who are grieved by what happened in Nova Scotia, have their moment. What's the agenda? What's the big picture here? They're trying to take uh, guns away from criminals? Well, by penalizing us as law-abiding citizens, that's not gonna do the trick. It will not, will not make one bit of difference. The basis behind all of this is a, a deep felt and absolutely to be acknowledged and empathized with fear. And if you don't know anything about a particular topic, you know, say firearms, then you find them, you'll find them scary. Particularly if all you are um, subject to is uh, the, the misuse of firearms, the, the um, stuff that you see on TV and uh, what's in the media nowadays. And if you don't know anything about firearms, you think, oh my God, that's, that's a horrible thing. Let's get rid of them. Why would, why would we possibly need them? Uh, and so I, the politicians have, have played on that, that fear to try to, uh, to buy votes and try to make, um, try to alleviate the, the fear um, in, the, in the unknowing masses. They will, uh, they will say, look what I've done for you now. Uh, now you need not to be afraid because now we're getting rid of all of these uh, bad, bad uh, firearms. A firearm, when we think about it logically, uh, a firearm was designed to kill. 
Um, but we've taken that and we moved it over to a sport that allows us to harvest animals to feed ourselves. We've moved it over to a sport that we can safely enjoy in shooting targets, whether it's uh, metallic or it's paper targets, uh, whatever the shooting discipline you're doing. But we're doing it in a safe fashion with all different types of firearms. There was no problem with these firearms earlier. Uh, We've been doing this sport for a lot of years, long before the change in government. Well, here we are in a situation where we're creating legislation or confiscating property um, from people that are, are legally allowed to possess it because of the appearance of the property, right? Whether it's pistol grips or, you know, strange optics or a flashlight on a gun, it doesn't make it more, more or less lethal. And, you know, something that we need in this, in this conversation is maturity and honesty and and intelligence and with gun control it just it seems it's always uh, that stuff is always in short supply what's the difference now what has changed why have they become so scary why have they become to the point that uh, they are so dangerous to society that i should not be able to have them as opposed to in the past i have not changed i'm the same person i I've done the same training to legally own those firearms I have in the past. The old analogy, guns don't kill people, people kill people, is a real thing. We could have done this entire interview with a loaded shotgun leaning up against my chair. And unless some lunatic grabs it and operates it, it's not gonna jump up and start killing people on its own. Those weapons are not for hunting. They aren't for shooting a prairie chicken or scaring off a bear. They're designed for only one purpose, to kill people and to look like they can kill people. If you're not a firearms owner and you've watched a lot of TV and listened to the media, you might have an image in your head of who gun owners are. You might have wondered, why does anyone need a gun? What could you possibly do with all these scary firearms that we're talking about? Well, let's take a closer look at who a Canadian gun owner really is and what ownership means to us. The CCFR is made up of people from every walk of life in Canada, uh, whether they're doctors, lawyers, mechanics, your next door neighbor. You know, we're just regular people who have had, um, who have had the, the, the opportunity to shoot a gun once in our lives, um, found out that it's, that's, it's incredibly exciting and um, there, it, firearms are a tool, not unlike anything else. And you can hunt with them, you can sport shoot with them, you can recreationally shoot. And it just, it's, it's a hobby and a passion that, that once you experience it, you really understand what it's all about. Hunting and fishing is deeply ingrained in our Canadian culture. Uh, if you go all the way back to when Canada was founded, it was founded by trappers and hunters. And, and um, you know, when they met the local natives who literally did that as a way of life, um, it's literally the truest and uh, most historic way that we have fed ourselves and, and kept ourselves alive. So uh, it's a huge part of our tradition. Also for me, a big part of hunting is, is getting out there and just reconnecting um, and, you know, well, disconnecting with the busy day and, and reconnecting with what really matters in life. It helps bring a lot of things into perspective for me. So what I love about it, about hunting is being able to just get out there and sit and know where you know your harvest is going to come from it's to most hunters i think it's like waking up christmas morning knowing that it's you know turkey opener or deer opener or goose opener you have had that bag packed for days or you've repacked it and the excitement that goes into it whether you're going to be sitting solo or sitting with a group of friends um, and knowing that you're you're doing this for you, you're doing this for your family. Yeah, it's you know I, I've uh, I've been hunting and spending time in outdoors since I was just really little, um, and I I enjoy that uh, that lifestyle. I enjoy being out in the out in the forest, and and it's interesting. I can be out hunting and I don't I don't have to shoot something. I can be just out enjoying the the outdoors, looking at wildlife, and uh, and carrying a gun is is it just feels comfortable. And uh, again, not hurting anybody, not doing anything illegal. And I, I, there's many Albertans and many Canadians that are the same. They, they want to have that opportunity to, to enjoy the outdoors and, uh, and carry their gun with them. They're, they're, they're legally purchased gun. 
not breaking any laws and and this this legislation that the that the federal government's bringing forward is uh, is counterproductive to that that kind of lifestyle we did have firearms on the farm and my grandparents would always refer to them as as a tool and and they were used as such so in the hunting sense i wasn't born and raised you know around firearms or or hunting per se but it you know they they still played a part in our our life on the farm. Raising cattle, uh, having uh, predators like coyotes and or getting rid of pests like um, gophers, things like that in the farmers fields and our fields that created a lot of problems for us. I mean that was just one tool we used to to remove those those pests and to kind of protect our protect our way of making a living which was farming. When we when we talk about the types of people that participate in the shooting sports, uh, it's people from all walks of life. Uh, it's your doctor, it's your lawyer, it's your teacher, police officer, it's your neighbor, it's the person that sits beside you in the church pew. Uh, you wouldn't know any different if they didn't tell you if the, they participate in the shooting sports of some sort. It's nice to go to the range or go to these events and you see uh, you see families that come out to it now. So it's. It's not just the dad or the mom going to a event, uh, the event to participate. They're they're bringing the whole family along. So the kids that uh, that participate with the parents, uh, they're at the the age where they've taken firearm safety courses as minors, and they can participate in events, and and so they have the training, and uh, yeah, they they enjoy it. When we're talking about our shooting sports, we're talking about everything from plinking with the 22 to trap and skeet long-range shooting, competitive shooting, with pistols, shotguns, and rifles. All sports that were enjoyed safely and up until May 1st, legally, by well over a million Canadians. The rise in popularity of shooting sports is meteoric. It, the shooting sports have been exploding, and one of the, uh, one of the indicators that you can you could look at to, to understand that is, um, there, was, there was a big story a few years back that over the preceding 10 years, and so I guess this ended about, uh, I don't know, about three years ago, the preceding 10 years, the number of restricted or prohibited firearms in Canada doubled, but primarily restricted firearms, typically handguns and black rifles, um, and most commonly AR-15s. The ownership of those firearms exploded in Canada, and the reason for that is shooting sports, um, the mystique around guns and the mystique around shooting sports has, has been evaporating. People know that it's a fantastic hobby. It's a, it's a fantastic skill to have. Uh, and firearms can be used safely um, and, uh, and very enjoyably every single day without incident. My aunt almost disowned me when I bought the gun range. She, she like killing gophers and all of that. And she's an she's old time farm girl. And it just totally disgusted her that people could shoot gophers. When I bought the range, she just about disowned me. I managed in talking her into coming and watching a competition. And she was like, no, 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 no. Finally, her, my other aunt, my uncles, and my grandmother all came to watch. And they said, I could not, but within two hours, they came up to me and they said, I could not believe that I would feel so safe with everyone there walking around wearing handguns but they see all of the rules that are in place that if you do not follow a rule to the letter, you are immediately disqualified from that match. You're done. There is no oops, there's no second chance. You break this rule or that rule or that rule or that rule, it's just, you're disqualified, you're done. So safety is a huge part of my like for shooting. Now, typically speaking, anytime uh, the government's gone out and done something to take uh, firearms out of our hands, it's always affected the one group, the group that was into uh, semi-autos or, you know, AR-15s and handguns. It's always affected that group. It's never really ventured on. So the other, other groups, they never would really stick up with us. It's always been our downfall. That's That's been the firearms community's downfall is because we weren't speaking together as one voice. It started to shift now where the hunter community and the shooting community and the guys that shoot black powder and the guys that shoot skeet are starting to realize that that it's affecting them now so they're starting to move more towards us 
we're starting to have a voice coming in one direction now. So we're all looking at this together and we're speaking together. I mean, if there's a silver lining, it's hopefully going to bring the firearms community together under one voice. So we're not, we're not all separate. We're not all divided because if we unite, that's 2.2 million people. Wild TV and CCFR present Gun Ban Canada, sponsored by the Canadian Coalition for Firearm Rights. Firearms Outlet Canada. LOF Defense Systems. The Colt Store. The Edge Group. As of today, the market for assault weapons in Canada is closed. From this moment forward, the number of these guns will only decrease in Canada. I have to admit, as a typical Canadian hunter, when the news hit on May 1st, I skimmed over the list of banned firearms and thought, well, it doesn't really affect me, I don't own any of those. But within days, this list continued to grow. And I quickly realized, this isn't someone else's problem. As a legal and responsible firearms owner, this affects us all. So I'm involved in this because our country has to do better and we can't allow crass politics and people who would use this debate for political gain or to change the channel or whatever. We can't allow them to, to win because we'll never reduce firearms violence this way. And we're also painting a bunch of people in Canada who care about this issue and, and, and you know, are upstanding citizens with a brush that they shouldn't be painted with. And that needs to stop. And it's that's why it's important to me. So I served in the military and I was injured overseas. And when I was, when I was injured, uh, wearing the uniform uh, with the Canadian shoulder flash, uh, where everyone could see it when I came into the the hospital, I was treated like royalty. Um, there's something special about Canada that everyone knows it around the world. Um, I was really proud, always proud to wear wear the Canadian flag. But today, uh, when I look back at my service to the country, I'm, I'm extremely proud of my little contribution. Uh, but it, it it just feels like it just doesn't doesn't feel like Canada. It just doesn't feel like this is the Canadian way to be acting. To at a stroke of a pen make major decisions that affect millions of Canadians. The way that the OIC was conducted should be a concern to every citizen who thinks that a constitutional democracy is the right form of government. If you already believe that we should have some form of dictatorship or some other form of government, then it doesn't matter because what we're headed towards with that kind of, of decree is not democracy. Up until April 29th, everything was fine. You know, we followed all the rules. We locked up our stuff. We uh, uh, we would go to the range and only shoot the items we were supposed to shoot at the range. We followed all the regulations. We've done everything that we needed to do as legal firearms owners to appease the government. We followed everything. We've locked up all our stuff. We did everything they told us to do. And as a thanks for that, they turn around and say, well, you guys are doing a great job, but we're going to in turn take more stuff out of your hands now. Because the criminals are getting it, the criminals are causing problems, therefore we must punish the legal guy because we cannot go after the criminal. Going after the criminal will be work. Going after the legal guy is quite easy because we're legal, uh, we're going to abide by all their rules, and we're going to follow through with their stuff. There's a line in this order in council that is extremely 
concerning for all firearms owners and they need to pay attention. There is a line in there that any firearm capable of firing a projectile which creates 10,000 joules of energy or more is prohibited. 10,000 joules of energy, they, lie, they introduce it as, well, that's your 50 caliber firearms. That is where, it, that is as far, and that's what, the, that's what the general public sees. What they don't understand is the word capable and 10,000 joules of energy. Where does that stop? A firearm capable of creating 10,000 joules of energy is many hunting rifles. The term capable in the dictionary means is it's possible and we've already had a court ruling on that in a court case back in the 90s. The judge ruled on capable. Capable means is it possible? Yes, therefore it's capable. And that term capable in that last line, because those last two lines, the bore over 20 mil and a rifle capable of the 10,000 joules are more detrimental to us than the entire order and council itself. Those two lines have the potential of taking far more out of our hands than what they've done up top. So that term capable is very important. We have to have that reworded. They have to start looking at addressing those two lines. If we don't, we're going to lose more stuff in the future, far more than what we're seeing today. And I think anybody should be worried about the, the invasion of property rights, but also the, uh, the kind of the incremental uh, approach that government has, that some governments have when it comes to removing firearms rights from, from individuals. And that's, that's what happens. It's, you know, they have a list of guns now that they're taking away, but of course, you know, if the Liberals are uh, elected to another term, they, they'll just go after more and more the next time. We just, we just need to stop it now, and we need to put up the biggest fight we can on this. Um, we, we shouldn't accept it because it's, it's just not right. With a proper democratic process, all of those things would have been ironed out in committee and would have been uh, probably a Senate committee, and they would have called on um, uh, experts in the field to say, okay, what are the implications? What's the downstream? Uh, unintended consequences. If we go through all our history, everything was done under a bill, everything was done through the parliamentary um, uh, system, everything was debated, everything was, was brought through, they had three or four readings on it, and, and they did the whole entire thing. This, they just came out, they didn't go through parliament, they didn't do anything with it, they just simply came out and said, here's your ban, this is it, it's all done in order and council, have a nice day. Unfortunately, a lot of people think, ah, they're not going to do that, it won't affect me. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, it will affect you at some point. We just don't know how, we don't know how far reaching it is. It seems like, as Canadians, we've grown into people that if it doesn't affect me, it's not my problem. But I think as we're seeing um, the progression of we're losing more and more rights, we're losing more and more privileges, if you want to look, look at them like privileges. We're losing more and more liberties, basic liberties. Free speech is under attack. It's been under attack for decades. And I think people need to really stop, take stock of where they are, and, uh, and they're gonna have to start standing for something because as these things get eroded, the people that are fighting now, they're not gonna be around. People like me, after I lose all my guns and, and after my fight is lost, I'm long gone. And now there'll, there'll be ten, hundreds of thousands of Canadians that won't stand with the next wave of gun owners that will lose their things. So it's really important that we think about that when our, when our brothers and sisters uh, that are gun owners are being attacked. If this Liberal government had no problem putting in place an OIC, an order and council, while Parliament was suspended, uh, during the middle of a pandemic to confiscate property, do you really think that they are going to stop there? Do you want to gamble on that? Are you so certain that you're not going to be part of this fight? And at the very least, at the very least, if you're like, ah, I don't care, you should care about democracy and you should be speaking up against this. Those heinous acts strengthen our resolve. And that resolve is to close the gaps in our gun control laws and to keep the most dangerous firearms out of civilian hands. So a few years ago, um, during the build-up to Bill C-71, um, Bill Blair was instructed by the Prime Minister to, to, uh, to launch this, this public consultation where Bill Blair and, uh, and some political consultants uh, created these events across Canada. I, I forget how many there were, probably four or five. I participated in the one uh, that was in, um, in Toronto. 
So basically they, they had brought in a bunch of different st stakeholders. They had some gun groups, they had some victims groups, they had anti-gun activists, uh, they had public safety people. Uh, and we all got in a room and it was a structured conversation. And honestly, the conversation was fantastic. And, and, and the conversation that happened in that room is the conversation that needs to happen out in the open in Canada. And it was extremely productive. Um, so I left and when the report came out, I was shocked. Honestly, a lot of that information made it into the report and the report was pretty candid and it was pretty honest and it was fairly accurate. And then what happened was Bill Blair threw all of that to the side and did what they were gonna do anyway, which was completely uh, the, the antithesis to what was established in all of those consultations. Thing where government has just taken it uh, on itself to, uh, to create this ban. Um, and uh, you know, and, and it had an advisory board that was made up of <clears throat> of people who um, who had bad experiences with firearms, and and virtually had no one on there that was uh, part of the recreational shooting culture. Uh, I think about three years ago now, I tabled a, a you know a petition in the House of Commons. It was very large. Uh, and it was calling upon the government to ensure that anybody who is sitting on an expert panel that was uh, advising the government on firearms training at, at the minimum had their pal, which I think, like if you're an expert panel, you should understand the firearms regulations in Canada in a very personal, meaningful way. And I don't subscribe to the notion that uh, understanding laws somehow revictimizes people, because if you're there to advocate on behalf of a public policy solution, you should understand what the current public policy context is. We're saturated with media that's coming in from the United States. I can't tell you the number of times. Virtually, it feels like every week I end up debating with somebody in Canada about firearms regulations that are based on the American context, or I'll debate somebody who presents me American data. Well, in the United States, this happens. Well, we're not the United States. It's unfortunate, but a lot of people don't understand that the gun policies we have in place or had in place previously were already extremely strict compared to what takes place down in the United States. But it's all of the information that people could consume from the United States that is kind of misinformed the general public to what the current conditions are here in Canada. And I think that's a big part of what's led to these decisions and led to some of the people blindly supporting this initiative right now. I didn't feel safer when this ban was announced. I actually felt embarrassed to be a Canadian, um, that our government would push something so ludicrous uh, without doing their homework, without listening to the municipality, you know, the police departments and what they need to do their job uh, because their hands are tied. They're the ones being handcuffed. As a, a frontline police officer and sort of the insight on how our justice system and how the law enforcement community works and looking at the OIC today, there is no indication that this is going to prevent violent crime. I don't see and I have had so many friends, co-workers, colleagues in the law enforcement community in disbelief, they're shaking their heads. They can't speak up because of the nature of their jobs. They're restricted by their code of ethics and conduct, but they're wondering how a piece of legislation like this is going to make their job any easier or any safer, let alone make Canadians any safer. Another area of frustration for gun owners is the fact that um, governments like the one we have now put very little focus on the root causes of violence because I think you really have to understand that when people say gun violence, they really mean violence, right? So whether it's but with guns or knives or hands or, or vehicles, violence is violence. If, if the government refocused its efforts into reducing the root causes of violence, not only would gun violence decline, but all violence, like everybody would win, all violence would decline. And when I say the root causes of crime, I'm talking about social conditions, mental health, addictions. Those are underlying causes of what where crime originates, not firearms that are legally owned, purchased, and used in vast number of shooting sports and hunting activities across our country. 
my background is from as a, a frontline police officer and sort of the insight on how our justice system and how the law enforcement community works and looking at the OIC today, there is no indication that this is going to prevent violent crime. The amount of money that this confiscation regime is going to cost the Canadian public is going to be astronomical. I don't even think they've costed it yet. Um, so when you think about public policy options that we actually need to implement in, in order to address the issue of firearms violence, be it reducing gang violence, um, detecting illegal firearms being smuggled in from the U.S., uh, mental health supports, more resources for the RCMP, all of those things. Of course, there's an opportunity cost to spending money on this, which there's no evidence that shows that it's going to work versus those other things. But there's another cost to this as well, too. This is this is this comes at the expense of Canadian democracy. You know, uh, it blows my mind that a law like this can happen so fast uh, without a lot of debate for starters. And I'll start, you know, I'll tell everybody first off, I put myself into that category of semi-ill-informed to start with. Um, but what's going on here is a travesty. It's, it's an absolute travesty. Um, trying to take guns, our hunting guns, away from the general public, um, law-abiding, legally owned, legally possessed, legally purchased, uh, is ludicrous. This confiscation regime, you have the government while we are, while Parliament is suspended in the middle of, of a pandemic, suggesting that they are, well, they are, through an order and council, confiscate the property of law-abiding Canadians without debate. But that's a cost. That's a cost to democracy. And people who, again, if, if, if somebody's listening to this and they're, and, uh, you know, they're, they're part of the anti-firearms community, they should care about this too. This is wrong. You look at the people that are voting or who are for this ban are people that don't know about firearms. They really don't know anything about them. So start educating your local people to say, this is what a firearm is. This is what they're doing to us. This is where we're going. Uh, this is the freedoms that they're taking away from me. Um, so education is a big thing. I need everybody that holds a pal in this country. You don't get to be silent this time. Sorry. You have to phone your MP. If you have a pal, you should be phoning your MP. You should be phoning a Liberal MP right now and saying, I am a, I am a, fire, a licensed firearms owner. This is wrong. You've got to not let the little pieces fall away. you got to stand up. you got to let your voice be heard. We hear it all the time for different things. Whatever the issues that are out there, that we face every day in Canada. It's the same thing. Let your voices be heard. Stand up for what's right. And as they take away the rights and uh, the property of law-abiding citizens, it's, it's incremental. They'll just keep coming and they'll keep coming and there'll be more guns that'll come on the list. We can inform ourselves and vote accordingly when the elections come up uh, and keep our freedoms. I don't want to look at this from a political gain perspective. I want to look at this as let's get public policy that keeps people safe and respects our civil liberties in Canada. And nothing this government is doing gets there. So this is for all the marbles. So something that's important to consider engaging in or supporting is the lawsuit um, that the CCFR has launched against the government of Canada. And the reason for that is it's about a lot more than guns. I think guns was just guns were just the segue. Basically, this lawsuit is going right through the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. It's going to address the Bill of Rights, and it's even going to address the Constitution Act. Because at the end of the day, the real problem in Canada is we don't have any rights to own property, or none that are truly recognized. So this case is going to have implications on how far the government can reach into your life, whether they can take your guns, any other property, take your bank account. We'll find out all that stuff. It's going to take years, but it's a battle, unfortunately, that's come to uh, come to the front of gun owners, and it's the it's I guess it's going to be the the weight that we're going to bear to find out whether Canadians uh, truly have any of these rights. Effective immediately, it is no longer permitted to buy, sell, transport, import or use military-grade assault weapons in this country. You've now heard from just a few of the Canadians that have been impacted by this round of gun bans. With their order in council, the government has spoken with no consultation or debate in Parliament. 
Our voices have been completely silenced in this matter. In the next episode, we'll take a closer look at the industry this band threatens to destroy. We'll hear from the mom and pop gun shops, range owners, instructors, gunsmiths, hunting guides and outfitters. The last time I checked the list, it is still legal to write letters here in Canada. It is still legal to contact your local MP and it's damn sure still legal to vote in Canada. Then again, I haven't checked the list in a couple hours. Have some respect for your fellow Canadians. Stand up for their rights because you may need them to stand up for your rights someday. Find a party, find a candidate that upholds your voice and then get out there and get them elected because that's the only way this is going to change. We need to stand up and do something. We need to stand up for ourselves. We've been on one knee for way too long. This is the big one. Get out and fight. Wild TV and CCFR present Gun Ban Canada. Sponsored by the Canadian Coalition for Firearm Rights. Firearms Outlet Canada. LOF Defense Systems. The Colt Store. The Edge Group. Go Big Tactical. Iron Sights. Modular Driven Technologies. P&D Enterprises. Phoenix Indoor Range and Gun Shop. Prairie Gun Traders. Select Shooting Supplies. Vortex Canada. Want Stalls Online. Wolverine Guns and Tackle. Arrowhead Coffee. Bell Outdoors. Canadian Access to Firearms. Italian Sporting Goods. KKS Tactical Supplies. KS Arms. Lone Butte Sporting Goods. North American Hunting Supplies. Rampage Coffee Company. Shooter's Choice. Stoger Canada. The Sportsman's Den. Williams Arms. Wolverine Supplies. <laughs>